Open your Bible, if you will, back to Psalms 119, Psalms 119. As you turn your Bible, I remind you of what the words they just sung said, if you feel your backs against the wall, you can't go on, all hope is gone. Remember, His mercy, God's mercy is still enough. You know, a lot of times we think, I can't make it. And the truth be told, you don't have to think that. You're right. You can't make it. I would almost say to you, you better start worrying when you think you can make it. Because that's where God's going to humble you. And he'll do whatever it takes. The hardest thing for me to do in my personal life is to thank God for everything, person, situation, self-afflicted wound, failure that he uses to humble me. But he does it because he loves you. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Psalms 119, we go back to the scripture. Last week we were in this text. Some of you recall we begin to read in verses 113 and We've seen that in Psalms 119, for those of you that have ever studied it, you know that this psalm is a psalm that's about the Word of God. If you've ever been in the Word or studied the Word or needed the Word, you, you know that there's nothing greater that brings you joy and happiness than God using His Word to be able to speak to you because things change and people change, but the Word of God, it's forever. He said in that text that we read that I'm safe and I'm glad that today even a week later and I say this carefully not boasting because I know many people struggled this week but after all the different events that happened this week and our state alone that I can still say that there's safety. I may not understand why things happen the way they have and why people struggle or why you struggle or I struggle, but I can truly say the day that I, I'm still safe. Why? Because I know what the Word says, that He'll never leave me nor forsake me. That's easy sitting here on a Sunday morning and a church that's dry and things are okay, but I wonder if we were sitting in the middle of Asheville today, how many people feel that way. But listen now, feelings, feelings will mislead you. One poet said it this way, feelings come and feelings go. Nothing else is worth believing. My hope is in the word of God, right? Nothing else is worth believing. Feeling come and feeling go. And the thing is, is the word is the one thing that lasts forever. You have to trust in the word. I wonder today, is that your safety? We now come to a latter part. We pick up in in the same chapter, but notice if you will, Now we start reading in verse number 121. The Bible says this. There's a great contrast that's here. He says, I have done judgment and justice. Leave me not to mine oppressors. But surety for thy servant for good. Let not the proud oppress me. My eyes fail for thy salvation. And for the word of thy righteousness. Deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy. They just sang about that mercy, didn't they? And teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for thee, Lord, to work. For they have made void thy law. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold. Yea, above five gold. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, I, and I hate every false way. You stop reading there. It's amazing. David writes, pins these words. He's an amazing man. If you ever study David's life, we could talk all day about the things that you've learned and I've learned and we've read about him. But David begins to, if I could say it this way, give, him, give himself a resume. Almost as if he's coming to the scene here and he's going to talk about some things. And if I were David, I would probably introduce myself like this. My name is David. I'm the one that defeated Goliath. That's probably what I would say. 
Or maybe some of you would say something like this. I am David. I am, I am the man after God's own heart. But nowhere did he ever say that about himself. But that is what God said about him. Some of you would say, I'm David. I am the sweet psalmist of Israel. Some of you may even go as far to be able to say, I'm David, I'm king of Israel. And you know what? All of those things would be right. That's not what David says. Matter of fact, when you study this text, you you notice that David, and you know that he, he is king, and he does have servants that's around him in verse number 121, he, he says this, he's in a position that he says, leave, leave me not to mine oppressor. So he, he's, he's in the midst of all of these enemies. I mean, there's people all around him and there's things that are happening. And, and I could say it a little bit further. It's not a game. It's real. It's a battle. And by the way, you are still in a battle today. That's never changed. You're always going to be in a battle And not everybody around you is always going to be for you. Sometimes you're going to feel outnumbered. You're going to feel like the minority. He goes on down in the text and in verse number 122 and notice what he says. He says, let not the the proud oppress me. I know know we don't like to talk about this a lot, but sometimes it's even us. But he says, I'm around people that they're full of themselves. They're always thinking about them, what they can get, what they can gain and and friend, if you were honest, you've said that many a times as well. I, I don't know if I trust them because they're more about themselves. They're more about them. And it's not just in the world. It's also in the church. There's a lot of people today, they're more about themselves than they are anybody else. It's about me, my four, no more. And all God's people said, amen. This is where David's at. In the midst of all this, he, he comes, but he, he turns the table. And notice what he does. He it's like he, he, he looks and he says, but I, I want to focus. I don't want to focus on the proud and I don't want to focus on my enemies. I, I don't want to focus what we do on a regular basis on all the negative that is in my life. He says, I don't want to focus on all of that. No, I want my focus to be on one thing, not even about who I am and about my title, what people see me. I, I want to focus on one thing. Notice verse number 125. He says these words, I... I am thy servant. I want to ask you a question today. If you were to find yourself, if you were to introduce yourself, I wonder how many of us would really say that I'm a servant. I'm a servant. Let me say this, and there's a lot that's going to be said, and the Holy Ghost will lead us to whatever, but if you don't hear nothing else, this just, this gets me right here. You know, it's amazing how many of us say that we're saved, we're on our way to heaven, that we're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when somebody treats you like a servant, you don't like being a servant no more. Who are they to talk to me like that? How could that happen? But yet we're a servant. It's not about us, it's about our master. But yet sometimes the the proud that we talk about, the people that are around us, we realize it's not the people we're talking about and it's not always the people that we're looking at. Sometimes the most proud is, is me. Because I'm not as much of a servant as I say I am. If we are a servant today, let the Holy Spirit examine our life. Where are you seen as a servant? Let me go a little bit further. How can you serve? Whose feet are you washing? You say, I ain't washing nobody's feet. You probably don't even wash your own feet. Somebody say, amen. (laughs) You just do the little fingers through the toes. You know what I'm trying to say? But I wonder today, who are you serving? I know we're here to serve the Lord, but watch me now. The Bible says that he came, listen, not, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. So let me go a little bit. Who are you ministering to? I mean, when you get down in the Bible and you slow down, we can get in here and we can preach a sermon and we can give you anything. But when that Bible comes to life and you put yourself in the Bible and the Bible gets in you and you begin to, to listen to it, I mean, things begin to jump off the page. You say, now, wait a minute. Is, is this really who I am? Because I don't know who I'm mis- ministering to. And by the way, let me say this. Just because you do something don't mean that's who you are. A lot of us do something and we say, well, I'm a servant. I do this. I do that. No, you can do a lot of things. You, you can put on a shirt and a tie and a suit and a dress and you can come to church and sit on the pew, but that don't make you a Christian. I want to ask you, are you a servant? 
The amazing thing about being a servant is this, is there's something about it that blesses us. There's a liberation, a joy because of the submission. See, when you look at this, you, you realize here he is. He, he's in a place that he says, I'm a servant of the Lord. I am thy servant. Let me just help you understand something. It's a lot easier to please him than it is to please a lot of other people. There's a liberation that's there because he don't jump one side and the other. And you don't have to say amen when I say this. But you know, people, when you begin to try to please people, listen, as long as you're doing it their way in their season of what they like, everything's all right. But I have learned and you have to, people change. There are one way today and there are another way tomorrow. But watch me, God never changes. So you know what? What God says in his word, it's black or white, friend. You don't have to worry about one side or the other. It's easy to be able to please the Lord because he makes it plain for you. The problem is we don't always want what he really wants. So we make it difficult. We, we sometimes will rebel or press back on those things, but... But yet we say we want consistency or, or we, can, we can honor somebody or maybe we can say it this way. We will respect somebody as long as they're true to who they really are. But yet when God has never changed, we can't always be true to Him. Some of us are saved, we're on our way to heaven, but you don't remember the last step you took for the Lord. You don't remember the last thing that you've done for Christ's sake. And I'm not talking about the things that we should do, about not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, about reading your Bible and about, about praying. I'm not talking about those things. As a matter of fact, how you expect God to be able to do the big things in your life when you can't do the little things in your life? Somebody help me preach right there. You understand what I'm saying? But I'm talking about when's the last step you took to serve the Lord if you're a servant? So being a servant is about submission, but watch me, it's also about sufficiency, <laughs> Oh, the beauty of this is, is listen, as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that means you have access to everything. I mean, He provides for me. He takes care of me. He guides me. I, I don't have to worry about my next step. I don't, I don't have to worry about the next things in my life. I belong to Him, and He's going to take care of me. So it's not something that shackles you down. It's not a bad thing to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, there's a great thing in that submission, but the greatest thing is the sufficiency ever. Everything is taken care of. My master, my heavenly father has always taken good care of me. Can I get a witness right there? It matters. So this world has turned things around. They have twisted things. But I just want to tell you today, the greatest thing that you and I can do and the greatest thing that you and I can be is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm meddling now, so let me meddle. You will love people better if you'll stay a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will forgive your family and your friends and your enemies if you will become, become and stay a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will take care of your problems if you will be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it'll make your life better. Paul said this in the New Testament. He said it over and over and over. We see it with David here. He says, I am thy servant. But Paul, he said it not once, not twice, but three times. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, when he introduced himself, I mean, listen, he had a resume too. Matter of fact, you can read it in the scripture, but when he introduced himself in Romans 1.1, Rome, Romans 1, 1, he says this. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to, to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. So here he is, he, he's introducing himself and he gives his name, but then he gives his identification. In other words, my name may be Jason Holly, but the greatest thing about me is not being a pastor. It's not just being a daddy. It's not being a husband. It's not being this or that or whatever else it may be. No the greatest thing to identify me is that I'm a, a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and I belong to Him and thank God He belongs to me. That is His identification. The problem is we forgot who we are. And, 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 and it shows when we make this Facebook post and last night, how many, how many Georgia fans we have in here today? Row, 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 row. The quiet dogs today, ain't they? They got beat by that roll tide. Somebody say amen. Ain't many Roll Tide fans in here either, but it's all right. But you know what happens is people begin to lose themselves. And, and I say this, and especially in football and basketball, 
in any kind of sporting activity, people will lose their character over a ball game. You want to know why? Because they, come, they become to be more of a fan than they are a Christian. Hey Amen. Listen, I love sports like everybody. Paul said, that's not the best thing about me. The best thing about me is that I'm a child of the Lord. I'm a servant of him. And whatever he says is what matters. And if that's not enough, he goes beyond. And in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, now he says, Paul and Timotheus, in other words, Timothy, he introduces them. And this is what he says. He says, the servants of Jesus Christ. So now he says, I want you to know it's not just me, but it's also the people that I am with. We are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, the greatest people that you can rub shoulders with and bring in your life are not people that's all about themselves and not people that want to make a big name for themselves and not people that always brag on what they've done and what they've accomplished, but people that truly want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. People that are sacrificial, people that submit, people that are willing to give themselves. I mean, they will make you a better person. Can I get an amen? I mean, they will make you a better person. Everybody wants a big name. Everybody wants a big church. Everybody wants a, a, a big ministry. Everybody wants to be known and make a lot of money and blah, 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 blah. I, I told those young preachers down there at Bible College last year, I said, listen, God don't need more celebrities. He needs more servants. That's what he needs. And by the way, that's not just for preachers. That's for Christians. He needs more servants, people that don't need to be a lead role in the ministry, but somebody that's willing to be able to do what nobody else sees. That's what God's looking for. It's almost like we're doing God a favor because we show up. We're here. We've arrived. Everybody relax. It's going to be taken care of. It's a pretty good sign that we're about to fall on our face if that's the attitude we got, right? Got to be a servant. I remind you, that's when people treat you that way. Paul didn't stop there. He goes on from Philippians, the book of Romans. And then he goes down to the book of Titus. He comes in the book of Titus. He says, Paul, a servant of God. And I love this. And again, he says, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So now when he begins to come in here, watch it. God is a God of perfect order. You believe that? Say amen. So in other words, there's not just a certain thing where it's placed here and it's placed there. So when Paul presents himself, the Lord specifically puts it on his heart by, by, by him pinning the words, led by the Holy Spirit. When you introduce yourself, first of all, it's not that you're an apostle. It's not what you are called to be. The first thing is you are identifying yourself by being a servant. So it's who you are with the Lord before who you are being sent by the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying by that? So I want to ask you today, are you a servant? I'm going to give you a few things quickly today about being a servant, the joy of being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, you write this down. When you have this, you have the master's confidence. Meanwhile, you have a servant's dependence. Where do you get that? Notice, if you will, in verse number 122, the Bible says this, going back to our text. It says, but be surety for thy servant, for thy servant for good. In reality, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in myself. I'm just being transparent with you. In reality, if you know you the way that you know you and nobody else does, and I know me, I, I, I'm a weak man, I'm a needy man, I'm not, I'm not looking for pity, I, 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 know, I know who I am. I'm a sinful man. And you can look at me judgmental, but you're just as sinful as I am. I, 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 I'm a man that, that cannot do the things that I need to do on my own. I, I can be a lonely man. Again, I'm not looking for, for the pity and all of these things. But, but when you come to it, you realize that it's not about me. It's about me depending on the Lord Jesus Christ because I could not do it without him. And every single day of my life, I am literally learning. I'm learning why. Because God can do more in my life and through my life than I could ever do by myself. And I'm thankful today that I am needy because if I do it I always make a mess of everything my marriage would be a mess my ministry would be a mess my life would be a mess my steps would be a mess my finances would be a mess everything in my life to the best of my ability 
As long as you've been saved, it's going to be a mess if it's all dependent upon you. But when you submit to the Master, oh, there's a confidence that's there because there's a sure word. Sometimes, listen, you're going to be led by feelings and led by emotion. But when you you submit to the Master, there's a confidence. Why? Because God always takes care of everything. What God does is not the best choice. It's not a good choice. No, what God does is always right. It's always right. That word surety, watch this. That word's used twice. It's known for two different meanings. The first one is a criminal meaning. In other words, there's a surety to where if somebody has done something in a criminal act, then that surety is that when they get out, that I just want you to know surety that everything's going to be taken care of. I will vouch for this person that they are okay. The second side of that word surety is not just a criminal, but also one that is in debt, somebody that owes. And that surety is saying that whenever, just like the Good Samaritan, that whenever I return, that whatever he owes, I will pay. I I will pay it in full. And here's the beauty of all of this, is when you think about you, and you think about your life, and you remember where you were when you got saved, and who you are today without the Lord Jesus Christ, you are literally a criminal. You understand that. You are literally a debtor. You owe more than what you could ever pay. But aren't you glad when God looks at you, there's a confidence that's there because he don't see Jason Holly and he don't see Travis and he don't see somebody else. No, he sees the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Bible says, for it made him to be sent for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Listen, I'm telling you, you ought to be thankful today that when God looks at you, he don't see you. He sees the precious blood of his son so what he's saying and there's a confidence and I want to tell you even after 21 years I've been born again oh if it was up to me to keep my salvation I'd have lost it the first moment I'd have lost it the next day the next week the next month the next year I'd have lost it day after day after day but that's why I believe what the Bible says listen for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not perish but have everybody help me everlasting life I don't believe in just internal security because my preacher, my pastor preached it. I don't believe it because my Sunday school teacher said it. No, I believe it because the Word of God said everlasting life. That's why I believe it. So I have a confidence today that I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And man, when I look to Him, when I fail, when I'm weak, and when I need Him, when I'm sinful, listen, I don't have to go back over and over and over and repent of my sin and get saved the second time, the tenth time, the, the thirteenth time. No, listen, I know that I'm on my way to heaven and I'm born again and everything's all right because God is my Father and God is my Master. So I'm a servant. And I want to ask you today, are you a servant? Because it's not something that shackles you down. It's something that liberates you. But not only that, but also a servant is somebody that has the master's mercy. But meanwhile, you understand the servant's prayer. Notice, if you will, verse number 124, he says it again. The Bible says this, he says, Deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy and teach me thy statutes. Most people, they view masters as, as a master who has a rod, somebody that will beat you. I mean, you know, when I get this visual of a master, I mean, I'm thinking of a slave driver. Somebody's got a whip, you know, going to hit you on the back. And, oh, that's not the master of God. No, it's mercy. You listen to me for a moment. It's mercy. Some of you have been hurt. You've got an image of yourself because of what people have said about you. They have said things about you that are true, and it puts a cloud over here. They've said things about you that are a lie. But when God, when God comes in your life and you get saved and you know that you belong to him and he belongs to you, no, as a master, he gives you mercy that is undeserving. And there's so many times that we, we struggle with these things and we say, Lord, I, I, I can't handle it. I, I, I don't understand. I, I don't know what to do. And we would think that we're going to be punished or we're going to be put down or we're going to be scarred or we're going to put, put away. I mean, people don't want nothing else to do with us, but there's never a day. There's never a day that God don't desire to be able to have a relationship and to be able to be in oneness with you. That's the mercy of our master. Do you understand how much he really cares and how much he loves you today? 
I mean, it's a big deal. A lot of people just think God pushes you away, but God ain't never going to push you away like that. He's full of mercy. That's who God is. And the key is, is it's plentiful mercy. Notice in the Bible, the Bible says this, and it's, it's intentional. He says, according unto. In other words, there's all access. So in other words, he is the example. He is the definition. He is full range of mercy. You understand? There's no such thing without him, without mercy. I mean, everything that you need with mercy comes in God himself. If you believe that, say amen. So if it's according unto him, then that means he has all access and all authority of mercy. Then all the mercy you're ever going to need, you're going to have because he is your master. Don't get happy about it, but isn't that a good thing to know this morning? I got mercy. People push me away. I hate to bust our bubble. Church people will push you away. I mean, you know, if, 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 you, if you contaminate their church and you mess up, I mean, they'd rather be out of sight, out of mind. They do. Meanwhile... There's old landing strip in Haynes Baptist Church, and all God's people said, amen. Remind me of an old preacher, he said, open them doors and open them wide, let them sinners come inside. I feel like that's Haynes Baptist Church. Some of them churches, they close those doors and close them quick, quick, because those sinners are about to throw them bricks. Right? I feel like we got the doors open. Why? Why? Because I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I don't come in here to be able to figure out just how perfect I am. I don't come in here to be able to see how good you are. No, we come in here to be able to talk about a good God. A good God. And He's merciful today. He's merciful. And the reason why I love you and the reason why I like you is because I have mercy on you the same way He has mercy on me. I know me better than you know me. And if He can give me mercy, listen to me, I know you deserve mercy. Because I know me. But see, as a servant, we forgot where we came from. We forgot. It's not just a, a plentiful mercy, but I want you to notice it. It's a purposeful mercy. Notice this now. This, this gets me. The Bible says in that same verse, in verse number 124, he says, deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy. And then notice this, and teach me thy statutes. Everybody listen to this. Too many of us are taking God's mercy just to get us out of what we're dealing with. But God's mercy is not just to get us out of what we're dealing with. God's mercy is to get us out, get us through, but to teach us not to do it again. I thank God for mercy, but yet we go right back to it. Are you or are you just looking for a green card to get out? Y'all don't, don't get quiet on me. See, mercy is not given to us to abuse it, though we abuse it. And I said we, not you. We all abuse it. Lord, if you'll just get me out of this, if you'll just let it not be seen, if you could just help us with our finances, God, I promise you I'll start serving you and giving and tithing. How many times have we said that? Lord, if you'll put my family back together, I promise you, I will serve you. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Meanwhile, abandonment, abandonment, abandonment. How many times has God got to rescue us before we realize that his mercy is not just a genie in a bottle? It's for us to learn. Can I stop and just say, that convicts me. I realize how much I take the mercy of God for granted. Even in intentions to do the right thing, all the time. There's things that I have said I would never do again, and I would never say. Many of you know I've been on this trip with my son. Forgive me, he's not in here. He's serving over in junior church. Trying to get his heart right. Praise God. Pray. Let's pray. Lord, get him right. Amen. Show him mercy. For I show him the wrath of God. I'm just kidding. Amen. He's a good kid. But I've been battling over and over and over, God. Keep me tender. And Brother Mitchell, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's not a weekly prayer, it's a daily prayer. Because the more I pray, Lord, keep me tender, the more I realize, listen to me, 
I'm not as tender as I should be. So when I bow before the Lord, God says, you just told me yesterday that you wanted to be tender. So in that moment, I have to thank God, Brother Stephen, for mercy. And then mercy leads me to repentance, not just to my Heavenly Father, but to my Son. I'm sorry. You want to know why relationships are severed today? Because we have abused and forgotten the importance of mercy in our life. We're full of pride. Relationships, marriages are hindered. Church families and church people are severed because we have forgotten the mercy that's been put in our life. I'll give you a third thing if somebody comes to the piano. It's a blessing to be a servant because notice, if you will, in verse number 125, he says, I am thy servant. And notice these words, give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. You get the master's teaching and the servant's learning when you truly are the servant that you're supposed to be. I don't know if you noticed, but in the first few verses, we heard the servant speaking, but now he's looking for the master to speak to him. Things are supposed to change, and, and maybe if I can break it down, I'd say it to you like this. You're in a position now to where all of a sudden God is beginning to speak. And can I just tell you today, the greatest thing, out of all of them that's great, one of the greatest things about being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ is that He still speaks to me. Look up here for a minute. He still speaks to me. I, I said yesterday, it was 21 years that I've been saved. I, I'll never forget. I'll never forget how the Lord, the Holy Spirit, He didn't audibly come to me, but I'm going to tell you something. I can tell you from circumstances in my life how God just continued to intervene and intervene and get a hold of my heart when I was lost. From situations with a mom that went to a hospital, from situations with family and friends, from celebrations with people that... Uh, and made decisions, things that God continued to do, and then me falling on my face, and me seeing me, not because somebody else said it, but because the Holy Spirit let me see it for myself. I'm glad that God spoke to my heart and helped me understand that I was lost and on my way to hell. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be saved today. But it didn't stop there, listen. Listen. Less than a year later, I'll never forget, months before, sitting in the pew. I told the church on Wednesday night, you want to know why I battled the call to preach in my life so bad? Because my wife was adamant. She did not want to marry a preacher, and God forbid she did not want to marry a pastor. So I was like, Lord, do I want to marry her? Or do I want to serve you? Somebody say amen. <laughs> it's the truth. But Miss Kathy... The reason why I battled, I remember sitting there in those pews and preacher preaching, on him they laid a cross. I remember him preaching, will you be the one? And you know what was happening, Brother Tim? God was speaking to me. And here I am, I'm his servant. Man, God's speaking to my heart. He could have left me alone, but he kept speaking, he kept speaking, he kept speaking, he kept speaking. And because of that, Man, I was able to be hear His voice. And, and God began to draw me and use me. And I answered that call to preach. And since that day, listen, I'm still thankful for the moments where God speaks to me. Just like I said with my own son. It's not, Brother Charlie, just about being a preacher. It's even about being a good daddy. I'm thankful today that He's my master. Because if it was up to me to be the daddy, the husband, the preacher that I'm supposed to be, the friend, I would fail you. But because he's my master, I can do right. I can be right in the best of my ability. And maybe this is just me, so let me preach to me. In my inadequacy, in me being fragile and feeble as a man, God still uses me. I've got a lot to be thankful for today because if it was up to me, I would mess. I'd mess it all up. But because he's my master and he does not grow silent on me, I still have the ability to be able to follow the Lord. 
I want you to notice what he says here, and I'm, I'm done. Notice what he says in verse number 125. He says, give me understanding. Oh, listen, I'm glad today that my, my master, he don't just tell me truth, he helps me understand the truth. I'm going to say that again. He don't just tell me the truth, he helps me understand the truth. Listen, I remember when I was a kid, today they call it ADHD or ADD or all those little, and I'm not mocking, I, I probably have all of it, okay? And I'm not mocking, I mean, I'm telling you. But when I was in school, I had this lady, she walked around with me and she was my comprehension teacher. You don't know why? Because I couldn't comprehend anything. You know, I was just so busy thinking about this or thinking about that. You know, I'm like, you know, they always give me the thing like squirrel, you know. <laughs> and what that means is like you're talking, talking, talking and something rolls by, you know, you get distracted so easy. That's me. Kevin, I'll be honest with you, I open up that book sometimes and I, 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 I can read the truth, but I don't always understand it. But because he's my master, he helps me understand. It's almost like me sitting down with my son or with somebody and saying, hey, let me explain this to you. I give this quote a lot, and I'm glad my master does this for me often. He don't just tell me and I'll forget teach me and I'll remember but he involves me so that I will learn he's my master some of you have been through some things and it was the master that helped you get through it and if it wasn't for that you'd have never learned what you should have learned you knew truth you knew when the Bible says my grace is sufficient for thee you knew truth but you never understood it until you understood the pain look at me of the thorn he gave you understanding I want to tell you today, the best thing you can be is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what the Bible says after that in verse number 126. He says, Lord, it is time for thee, Lord, to work. You know why I'm glad he's my master? Because he's always working. He's still doing something on my behalf. Listen, when I don't even see God working, he's still working. If you're thankful for that, say amen. God's still working. When you don't even see it, he's working. He goes on down, notice if you will, he talks about how precious it is to him. Verse number 127, therefore, because you're my master, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. He said, Lord, I want you to know above everything that's in my life and everything that I have, Lord, I want you to know the very thing that you being my master and you teaching me, it matters more than anything else that's precious to me. You know what's happened? There's been some things that's become to be more precious to us than him being our master and us being a servant. Hey, look up here. Some of you used to have a towel. And because you forgot who you were serving, you begin to wash Thomas's feet and Peter's feet. And you understand your Bible. People that done you wrong, lied about you, they doubted you. You said, you know what? I'm done with that. I'm tired. You forgot who you were serving. Some of you need to get your joy back. Say, Lord, I'm in this because of you. Not because of me, but because of you. You need to pick your towel back up. Old Phillips family used to sing that song. I wish I could sing. Picking up my towel. You know, I can't sing it, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you need to get down an altar today. You and the Lord, nobody knows, and pick your towel up. Why? Because he's your master. And he gave you mercy. I want you to notice this last thing. He says here, he says in verse number 128, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. He says, I'm glad you're my master because in the midst of all the lies and all the things, God, you still teach truth. In other words, everybody can say what they want, but God, I know you're in control. So I want to challenge you today in closing. Would you stop today and say, Lord, I just want you to know that I'm willing to hear and as your servant, I'm ready to obey. Slow down for a second. Be still. I want you to think about that. I'm willing to hear, but I'm ready to obey. I want to ask you today, are you ready to obey the Lord? We used to sing that song, that youth choir song. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. Some of us used to trust him, but we won't choose to trust him today. 
Some of you got some burdens, some problems, some plans. You're trying to figure it out. The master's already got everything. Listen, he's got it all figured out. He just needs you to be obedient. So I'm going to ask you today, will you trust the master again? I'm not asking you to trust the church, trust the preacher, trust the people. I'm asking you, will you go back to you, watch me now, 21 years ago from yesterday I got saved. Will you go back to where you first began? And, 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 and things like this. You want to sing in the choir? Absolutely. I didn't, I didn't even know a song. I didn't know nothing. I just got up there. Just got up there and sang. Why? Because I had a soft heart. He was my master. I was willing to do whatever it was. If it was shaking hands at the door, I'd do it all. And I'm not bragging on me. I'm just saying, I can't talk about you because you'll be mad at me if I talk about you. But I'm talking about me. But y'all can relate. There was a time where we were so tender and we were such a servant that Lord, whatever he said, wherever he said, to whoever he said, we would go up and apologize. I'll never forget, preacher, you might not remember this. Our churches be split in the middle, not divided, but split in the middle. Had a had a had pews on both sides, and I'd go around both Tim and I'd shake hands with everybody. You know, I just I mean I just seen that's what people did. So I was like, praise the Lord, good to see you, hallelujah. You know, I didn't know nothing. I, I didn't even have a suit coat. I'd be walking around like this right here, and man, I was, I, I still look funny, but I was really funny then. And I'll never forget, man. I was walking. I was on the back right side, and I went to go shake this guy's hand, and he wouldn't shake my hand. He just looked at me, and I'm like, hey, brother, good to see you. I didn't even know his name. You know, I'm like, hey, good to see you. He wouldn't shake my hand. And for the, for the first moment since I've been saved, the old Jason rose up in me. I mean, I wasn't going to fight in church, but I was like, wait a minute. Like, there's confrontation right here. And I realized church people ain't all perfect. Man, I, listen, I, I went back. I went to the altar. I didn't even know what was wrong. I went to the altar that day. I was like, oh, God, what did I do? I'm so sorry. I turned around, I'd done everything I could. I chased him outside the door and said, hey, I don't know what's wrong. I just want to tell you whatever it is. I'm sorry. Watch me now. Not bragging on me. That was the tenderness of being a servant and not being over it. Today, God has to affect my wife or affect my son or affect something in my life sometimes to get my attention. And again, let me preach to myself. But you remember when you were tender as a servant that you would do whatever God told you to do? Maybe today we just get that soft heart back and say, Lord, I am your servant. Our Heavenly Father.